Uh, here we have an example. Well, this is actually the alleged vehicle that uh, the two killers of Lee Rigby, so we're told, uh, were driving when they hit him and allegedly crashed into a lamppost. As you can see, the vehicle is very severely damaged. Uh, I'm not a, a technical expert, but uh, my own analysis would suggest that this vehicle was traveling at about uh, 50 or 60 miles an hour when it impacted something that looks rather like it would have been a lamppost. I would suggest that in such an incident, the vehicle occupants would be very badly uh, injured, uh, would be concussed, and would probably need uh, hospital treatment. Um, furthermore, I also consider the fact that there would be very obvious damage to the lamppost. Uh, but that uh, is something you'll have to think about. As you can see, in a normal car crash, uh, when a vehicle uh, hits a lamppost, uh, be it concrete or, or, or steel, or indeed um, a tree, the vehicle impacts and, and, and wraps around the, the, the object. The energy, uh, the vehicle cannot bounce back. It's not a bumper car. The, uh, the vehicle decelerates uh, it within milliseconds as it hits the object, and the energy is transferred, but the vehicle does not bounce back away from the object that it's hit. This can be proven by looking at thousands of available uh, accident scenes. Here we have an example of a, of a sports car that has hit a, uh, a lamppost. As you can see, the vehicle is embedded in the lamppost, and this is what one would have expected to have seen had the official story of the Lee Rigby incident been true. Uh, vehicles cannot bounce back uh, two or three feet from the lamppost if they hit it. I mean, that's just a fact. And here we have a, a humorous uh, picture of a guy uh, contemplating the damage to his vehicle after it hit a lamppost. And yet again, another lamppost crash, and as you can see, the vehicle has not bounced back. The lamppost is very severely damaged, as you can see. It will be visible to any onlooker who came shortly after the event. And uh, obviously, uh, it doesn't resemble in any way the uh, Lee Rigby incident. This vehicle has hit a tree. It's been very badly damaged. Uh, but as you can see, it hasn't even bounced away from the tree. It's embedded in the tree and uh, something similar. These are just examples. Uh, this uh, uh, mini uh, small truck has hit a lamppost. The lamppost has been uh, uh, at a 45 degree angle, very severely damaged lamppost. Um, but as you can see, uh, the vehicle has not bounced off the lamppost and the lamppost has been very clearly damaged that anyone could see. And again, this vehicle has crashed at high speed into a, a lamppost it's embedded into the lamppost, it hasn't bounced back. Now we come to the um, uh, fake Lee Rigby episode. Uh, as you can see, there are lots of people having a nice chit-chat to these two maniacs who supposedly cut a man's head off. I don't think you need to take the pulse of somebody who's got his head missing. And anyway, nobody in their right mind would intervene in a situation like that. Had, a genuine, had two genuine maniacs with a knife just chop someone's head off outside an army barracks you would have waited for either the army or the police to do something. You certainly wouldn't have stopped to get involved. Uh, these women are not acting in accordance with normal human behavior. They're agents as part of a spy, uh, PSYOP. And furthermore, if you look at the white truck behind, this was the vehicle used to deliver the, uh, the, uh, the, the Vauxhall to that particular site. I presume it drove down the road. Uh, the vehicle was pushed out somehow or other, perhaps using, um, could have been done in, a minute or two, put into position, and then the vehicle was backed up. The road, in fact, was closed before this event took place. This was probably to give the, uh, the perps the opportunity to put all the fake evidence in place. Uh, conveniently, one of the uh, knife men decided to buy some knives at Argos a few days before this event, leaving a nice paper trail. Uh, conveniently, the, um, the receipt for these knives was in the back of his vehicle. Um, Exactly why you would need to buy knives to run somebody over with a car is not explained. Uh, lots of people have knives available, but this guy bought uh, expensive knives from Argos, which is conveniently caught on camera. And uh, not only that, he had the decency to leave the receipt in the back of his car. How convenient.
Another perplexing aspect of this whole event was the fact that this event took place right outside Woolwich barracks. One would expect the Woolwich uh, soldiers, squaddies, uh, and there are always men, I mean, I'm ex-military myself, albeit uh, reserves, um, would have been on the spot very quickly. If uh, one of our soldiers had been killed by a maniac outside the barracks, it wouldn't have taken too long for somebody to go in and get involved. Um, uh, there are guards at the gates, after all, uh, but nobody whatsoever appeared. That's very, very perplexing, and it doesn't make sense if the official story is to be believed. Uh, this guy is, uh, is uh, he's on uh, the news. He's got uh, his left, his, uh, his hand is being, uh, he's got two knives in his left hand, and he's got what looks very much like stage blood on his, is uh, a right hand. Obviously, for a right-handed person, as I presume this man is, to carry two knives in your left hand isn't very good in an offensive sense, because uh, you'd be more likely to do damage if you had a knife in your right hand. Uh, uh, what another odd, uh, aspect is that the person who filmed this turned out to be an EDL member. So how convenient for an EDL member with their known dislike of uh, Muslims and black people to actually be the one to record this particular scene. Uh, note that the, the EDL member did not attempt to intervene, disarm this Muslim, but allowed this guy to read a script, which is what it was. It was a script. The guy was reading from a script, which he'd learned by heart. and. Um